This week's uh, talks bring our summer programme of virtual events to a close, but not before I express how grateful we are for all the help and generosity of parents, colleagues and alumni across our community, without whom this programme, which has kept us entertained all summer, would not have been possible. Thanks to you all too for joining us this evening. Your generous donations at registration for this event have helped raise over £400 for our bursaries appeal, a key part of our Inspiring Minds campaign. This year, uh, this year saw a significant growth in the numbers applying for bursaries throughout the school, and we are delighted that our appeal will be able to fund five new bursaries from September. Your continued support has helped make this happen and is very much appreciated. Thank you. We are delighted to welcome Rachel Collier, Head of Sixth Form. After studying classics at Oxford, Rachel worked for four years in magazine journalism before retraining as a teacher. And during her 17 years at Dulwich College, Rachel completed an MA in Applied Linguistics, endeavoured to feed her family of six on a budget of £100 a week, and was selected as a competitor for MasterChef. It's clear from her extensive experience and the title of this evening's event that Rachel is as passionate about language and linguistics as she is about cookery and nutrition. You're in for a real treat tonight as Rachel explores the Latin and Greek roots of the word pastry, followed by a masterclass in three classic pastry dishes. These three demonstrations were pre-recorded before the editing was complete and will now run for 28 minutes in total, not the 21 that are mentioned in the film. Enjoy. Well, good evening and welcome. It's a real privilege to have been offered this platform and I hope that my rather esoteric combination of subjects doesn't come across as self-indulgence. It's just that my great preoccupations, you might say obsessions in life, are language and cooking. So I've leapt at the chance to talk about both with the aim in the great tradition of the BBC to inform, educate and entertain and all in aid of an excellent cause, raising funds for inspiring minds so that we can open up a Latimer education to as many fertile young minds as possible. As a historical linguist and a really keen cook, I get very excited when I learn new things about the language of food. Whether it's the origin of the word ganache, the reason we call the meat on our table something different from the animal in the field, the way different languages convey instructions in recipes, or why foods like hummus or tabule have so many variant spellings. I settled upon pastry as the overarching theme of this evening's talk because it has an interesting etymology, some surprising cognates, by that I mean related words, and because there are a number of pastry dishes in my repertoire of family favourites that I've been collating on a blog which I started this year for my four young adult children. So how do we define pastry? Well, According to the Oxford Companion to Food, it's firstly a mixture of flour and usually fat and water with sometimes other ingredients made into a dough and cooked as a case or cover or support for a pie or tart or pasty. And secondly, a particular dish which consists of pastry, thus for example pastries, are the collective name for items produced by the skill of a pastry cook or a pâtissier. There are five broad categories of pastry, which I'll cover a bit later when we move on to the more practical side of things. Now, the history of pastry cooking can be traced back to ancient times. It's likely that the Egyptians cooked with it, and we find mention of small pastries in the comedies of Aristophanes, a 5th century BC Greek playwright. The Romans did make pastry, but they weren't big on it because their cooking was chiefly with oil. And in medieval times, they used something called a huff paste, which was a protective pastry case for cooking meat. Uh, the pastry wasn't actually meant to be eaten, but there were other medieval pastry-based tarts that we know were eaten. So what about the word pastry in English? Where does it come from? Oops, sorry. 
Well, it goes right back. We can trace its origin right in a direct path right back to classical Greek. The first thing to explain is that English pastry developed from the word paste, which is adopted from Old French bast, which derives from late Latin pasta, which is a translation of Greek pastere, that is akin to pastos, which means sprinkled, and it's the perfect participle of passo, I sprinkle. Now, pastere, in fact, this word here, was a sauce mixed with flour. Pastos, sprinkled, and the verb passo, I sprinkle. Incidentally, these abbreviations and notations that I'm using are deliberately chosen because this is what you would find in an etymological dictionary. So this sign here means comes from, so pastry comes from paste. This abbreviation OF is Old French and LL, Late Latin, GK, obviously Greek, and PP is the past participle. Now, how did paste become pastry, well, that development is part of the same story because we've got late Latin pasta, which has a derivative pasticius, or pasticius, whence we get old French pâtissier, the verb to cook pastry, which when used as a noun has the derivative pâtisserie. And it was this that combined with English paste to form English pastry. Variations on the word in English include pasty and patty, which of course both ultimately have the same derivation. But there are some less obvious connections too, um, some of which I've only learned about in the course of preparing this talk that I want to share with you. So first of all, in French, Old French pasta became pat, which is the word for pastry in French, by a regular sound change recorded in the spelling of the word with this circumflex on the A, de denoting a lost S. I think anyone who learned French at school is likely to have been taught this, and you'll know that English equivalents often still have an S where the French has lost it and it's marked by a circumflex. So we might compare forêt, forest, hôpital, hospital, and chateau, castle. As an aside, I can't resist lobbing in that in a controversial 2016 spelling reform, the Académie Française removed the circumflex from a number of words. Uh, three topical examples are oot, um, and the culinary examples goûter, to taste, think about English disgusting, which still retains the S, and huître, where our word oyster still has the S. But what about the connection with pâté? Now, along with the shape of the word in French, the meaning of pâté has evolved. Originally, it was a pie or a pasty, a pastry case filled with any of various mixtures, baked in the oven and served hot or cold. But by extension, the uh, term came to mean not only the whole pie, but also what was in the pie, especially if it could be served cold in slices, much the same meaning as terrine. Interestingly, once pâté had evolved in this direction and was not thought of as being in a pastry name, pastry case, sorry, a name was needed for when it was in a pastry case, and the phrase pâté en croûte fills this gap. There are also some intriguing derivations that have come into English from Latin via Italian and French and are used in non-culinary contexts. An example is late Latin pasta, which became Italian pasta, which is paste or dough, which has the derivative impastare, to make into a paste. And whence we get the noun impasto, which is a painting technique, um, referring to the thick application of a sort of doughy pigment to canvas adopted by English painters. And then also from late Latin pasta, we get the diminutive, that word, did that abbreviation dim means diminutive, pastellus, which is a seal or its impression in wax 
and whence we get the French pastel that's adopted by English. And we think of wax colours um, are called pastels. And then thirdly, Latin pasticcius, pastry, became Italian pasticcio, a paste, hence a hodgepodge, literary or musical originally, and from that we get French and English pastiche, which nowadays is used about a direct imitation. Finally, a really surprising connection to the English word quash. To understand this, we need to get a bit technical and go back to Greek, where it all began with paste and the verb passo to sprinkle. Now, historical linguists trace the origins of Greek and Latin, and indeed the majority of European languages, to Proto-Indo-European, the lost parent language, which has been reconstructed on the basis of cognates in a large family of languages. The reconstructed Proto-Indo-European root for shake is quit, where the important sound to note is this initial qu. The asterisk, by the way, means that it's reconstructed and not attested, while this H with the subscript 1 is something called a laryngeal that we don't need to worry about today. Now, this qu sound here is a labiovelar, something produced in the back of the mouth with the tongue up against the soft palate, that's the velar part, with rounding of the lips, that's the labio part. And the treatment of these labiovelars in Latin and Greek has given rise to some surprising, not immediately obvious cognates. In Latin, they're usually represented by a k or a qu, depending upon the other sounds of the word they crop up in. Um, sorry, in Latin, they're usually represented by a k or a qu, but in Greek, depending upon the other sounds in the word they crop, they crop up in as k, T or P. So the Indo European root quet becomes quatio, I shake in Latin, and then quasso, and then casse in Old French and English quash. But in Greek, this root quet becomes passo, I sprinkle from which our friends pasta, paste and pastry has, have, have sprung. So I think it's fascinating that we've got this word quash, which of course gives us the word squat, the verb squash as well, um, that is actually directly cognate with English pastry. Incidentally, that alternation between a qu in Latin and a p in Greek can be seen in lots of other cognate per pairs. So, for example, the words for how, um, the verb to follow, the verb to leave. And in fact, I've got two English words of Latin and Greek origin, respectively, that illustrate this. So if you consider the word equestrian, which comes from Latin equus, horse, and the word hippopotamus, which comes from Greek hippos, horse, and potamos, river, um, the Proto-Indo-European word reconstructed for horse was equos, where we can see that the labiovelar qu has, um, has become a qu in Latin, but a p in Greek. Segwaying now from things linguistic and theoretical to matters culinary and practical, I promised to come back to the five types, broad categories of pastry. And here they are. We've got short crust, which is often used for the base of a tart, quiche or pie. It can be either sweet or savoury. Puff pastry, which is flaky, light, made from a laminated dough with solid fat, typically butter, repeatedly folded and rolled into the base dough. It's very time consuming to make. Quicker to make is rough puff or flaky pastry. This is light and flaky, it's unleavened, it's similar to but distinct from puff pastry, as the name suggests. It incorporates more fat into the base dough than puff pastry and it's a lot quicker to make. 
Then we've got choux pastry. This is a light pastry dough. You'd be familiar with it um, from profiteroles and things like that. It contains only butter, water, flour, and eggs. Instead of a raising agent, it uses a very high moisture content to create steam during cooking to puff up the pastry. And then finally, phyllo, which is a very thin, unleavened dough used for making pastries like baklava and burek in Middle Eastern and Balkan cuisines. The three in red feature in the recipes that I'm about to share with you. Two ready-made. If you've ever tried making puff pastry or phyllo pastry yourself, you'll understand why it's better to buy it. And one made from, stra- from scratch. Now, the three recipes are, firstly... Um, a kulibiak, or sometimes it's spelt with a C rather than K. Um, it's from Russian kulibiaka, and it's a pie filled typically with fish, chopped hard-boiled eggs, dill or parsley, and kasha, which is groats or buckwheat, cooked inside an envelope of yeast dough. Nowadays, you're much more likely to find it made with puff pastry or rough puff, but the traditional version uses a variation on rich short crust pastry leavened with yeast. Uh, similarly, rice features in my recipe rather than groats. I've come across a fascinating reference to Kulibiak in Russian literature in Gogol's Dead Souls, uh, where Chichikov has just retired to bed after another gorging session with his host, Petuk. But unfortunately, his bedroom is next to Petuk's study, and through the wall, we can hear Petuk ordering the following day's culinary delights. Make a four-cornered fish pie, he was saying, smacking his lips and sucking in his breath. In one corner, put a sturgeon's cheeks and dried spinal cord, In another, put buckwheat porridge, little mushrooms, onions, soft rose, and brains, and something else. Well, you know, something nice. And see that the crust on one side is well browned and a little less done on the other. And make sure the underpart is baked to a turn, so that it's all soaked in juice, so well done that the whole of it, you see, is, I mean, I don't want it to crumble, but melt in the mouth like snow, so that one shouldn't even feel it, feel it melting. As he said this, Petuk smacked and sucked his lips. Well, I'll be sparing you brains and spinal cord, but there are mushrooms and salmon in mine, so I hope Petuk would approve. Spanakopita is a classic Greek pie made with phyllo pastry and filled with spinach, feta, herbs and eggs. I've explained phyllo already, but it's worth adding that although the word is Greek from the word for leaf, the pastry is of Turkish origin, stemming from the Turk's custom of making layered bread. I'm making no claims for authenticity of my version. Um, Most examples of spanakopita that I've encountered in Greece are flatter than what I make, but it's what we like to eat as a family. And then thirdly, lemon tart, or tarte or citron, this one's a French classic, made with a sweet short crust pastry to which I add both ground and chopped almonds. Uh, The tart, the the term tart in English overlaps with flan, subsumes quiche and pizza, and is largely replaced in North America, America by pie. It's been in the English language for centuries, coming in via French, The tart is actually found in a 14th century English recipe compilation. Fillings were originally savoury before the trend shifted towards sweet tarts. And the related words in German and Italian are torta and torta, which usually actually mean cake. You'll find detailed recipes for each of these on my blog, uh, yearsofpractice.com, that reflects a family saying, I can explain later if you're interested, which has an easy to navigate menu at the top. Kulbiak obviously is found under fish, Spanakopita actually under three sections, Greek, vegetables and vegetarian, and lemon tart under puddings and fruit. And there will be a reminder of the link after each of the practical demonstrations that follow.
Now, these demos have been filmed at home over the course of the summer with the help of my daughters. Each recipe has been edited down with some expert help from our own Johnny Behane to about seven minutes. I apologise in advance for the subpar lighting in the earlier demonstrations. We've very much been learning as we go along. Uh, just actually, as in fact, as many Latimer teachers had to develop their technical know-how in order to adapt to remote learning. It's been something of an exponential learning curve. I really hope you find them instructive and I'm looking forward to chatting and fielding questions in the Q&A afterwards. So my Kuliviat recipe comes from Sophie Grigson's fish cookery book, which was published 22 years ago. And I've been using it and making this recipe ever since actually. Um, her mother was Jane Grigson, whose monkfish recipe is on my blog. Yeah. And uh, I made this Kuliviat recipe for New Year's Eve 1999 for the millennium, I remember. Here are the ingredients. This is the stuff you need for the pastry. We've got shop-bought puff pastry because who's got time to make real puff pastry these days unless you're on Bake Off. Um, a little bit of egg wash. That's simply a egg yolk mixed with a dash of milk. Oops. And then 30 grams of butter, which is going to be melted and poured into the slits at the top of the pastry at the end. I believe that the Russians, there is one Russian recipe which enriches their kulibiat with the spinal cord of the sturgeon. We're not stretching to that today. I've got 600 grams of smacked salmon, which I've baked in the oven with a little bit of uh, lemon juice, a knob of butter and some herbs for about 25 minutes. Which herbs? Herbs are some dill and parsley, which is also what's going to go in the mixture. I've got two tablespoons of chopped parsley and two tablespoons of chopped dill. Then we've got 60 grams of basmati rice that I've boiled up until it's al dente with a dash of turmeric to make it that lovely golden yellow colour. Two hard boiled eggs chopped up and then an onion finely chopped, some ordinary mushrooms, 175 grams chopped up quite small, they will shrink during cooking as well. And I've got uh, 60 grams of butter, which is what we're gonna cook the onions and the mushrooms in, and 15 grams of porcini that I'm gonna soak in water for about half an hour and then drain it and chop up finely. And then I'm gonna cook up the onions, mushrooms, butter and porcini. Um, until it's really, really soft and mixed all together to make the filling. One little tip, if you, if you save your porcini water, stick it in the freezer after you've soaked it. It makes a lovely addition to a sauce or a risotto. So the salmon has been flaked up, stirred it in with the rice, with the herbs, the eggs, and I've cooked down the onions, mushrooms and porcini into this lovely moist mush with the butter. They've, all the water's evaporated. So that's gonna go in there. A bit of salt and pepper. We we'll put quite a bit of pepper in actually. And then that's your lovely filling. Now, to build your pie, so we'll go to the pastry bit now. A bit of flour. You want to get it into a sort of rectangle that's about 30 by 40 centimetres in size. I roll it out a bit bigger than that because I want to be able to cut off some bits for decorating it. Keep your pastry chilled for as long as possible before you start rolling it. My domestic science teacher at school, Mrs. Skelton, always told me you should never turn your pastry over. You should just keep it the same side up. I'm going to need a bit more flour. So I'm now going to just press it so that I'm left with some cuttings to make the decorations. 
and also to tidy up the edges. four strips that I'm going to put along the top to make a sort of crisscross pattern. Now, this is just a baking tray lined with greaseproof paper and slightly oiled and it's much easier if you actually build it on the tray rather than try to transfer the completed pie on there afterwards. So you pile your filling down the middle. This is the slightly scary bit. So much. But I'm going to use my hands to pack it together so it doesn't take up quite as so much space. Is there ever a problem that your filling is too wet? No, because actually, you add a bit more melted butter at the end, but one of the reasons you have to cook the mushrooms down and make sure all the water comes off is to make sure that there isn't, uh, it, it, that the filling isn't too wet. And in fact, this is, this is a pie that can work quite well, both cold for a picnic and hot. So if it's nicely packed together like this, it will hold its shape. But you do need some kind of sauce with it afterwards um, either mayonnaise or I think one of you I'm going to ask if you don't know yet to make some holidays for lunch today. Oh look I've got a little bit left here. So with my egg wash I'm just brushing the egg edges all the way around. I'm going to need more egg wash for the top. And then bring it over like that. Stretch it slightly so that it does join in the middle. Oh, perfect, look. Just a little bit too much there. Now cut that off. And then I'll paint the edges again. I'm going to roll those up to seal just like that. Doesn't mean your edges are going to be quite heavy on the pastry. And now, this is the slightly tricky moment. I'm going to roll it. Oh. Oh. my little strip and then that's gonna go like that there. I've got little bits of herb on the outside but don't worry about that. It shows that it's authentic. It tastes just as nice. And then another little strip here. And finally, a little one like this. And then you need to make some slits in the top, which is what we're going to pull the butter through. Three or four. So if I do one here, so I've got a hole in the pastry already and I'll do one here, one here and then my fourth one here. They're completely even are they? And we're going to leave that to rest for half an hour before it cooks in the oven for 35 to 40 minutes on 200 or 180 fan. So I'm just going to put that aside for half an hour. 
Now, rather shamefacedly, I have to admit that I didn't let this pastry rest for the required time. And I paid the price for my impatience because my splits have spread a bit. But we can still pour the butter in, makes it a bit easier. So we just pop it in each of the slits. Uh. Oh, I brushed it with egg wash before I put it in the in the oven. And let's serve. Oh, I've got a plate already. Let's serve a piece. Moment of truth. There we are. You can see the, the end of it there. And we'll pop on some beautiful hollandaise made by one of my daughters just now. There we are. My recipe for Spanakopita comes from a book by Claudia Roden, who in turn credits it to an Athenian cookery writer, so I'm pretty confident that it's authentic. Here are the ingredients. For the pastry, we've got a pack of phyllo pastry, that's about 220 grams. Keep it covered for as long as possible because phyllo pastry is quite liable to dry out and we'll be brushing it with a mixture of olive oil and butter. And then for the filling, I've got 500 grams of spinach, which I've blanched, drained and chopped. I think the easiest way to blanch spinach is to um, wash it in lots and lots of water, scoop it out in handfuls, shake off the water, put it in a pan and with just the water clinging to the leaves, cook it down until it's all wilted. It takes just a matter of a few minutes. Um, and then also two tablespoons of chopped parsley, two tablespoons of chopped dill. You can use any combination of these two herbs, one or the other or both. And we've got four chopped spring onions and two generous heap tablespoons of grated Parmesan. 300 grams of feta cheese. I've kept the remaining 100 grams from the second packet to put in a Greek salad that will accompany this. And four eggs. I think these are four large eggs. So what I'm going to do is fry up the spring onions and the spinach in some of the oil and butter, stir in the herbs, allow it to cool before mixing it with the rest of the ingredients. Mashing the feta, whisking the eggs and stirring in the parmesan. Here is my spinach fried up with the spring onions and I've stirred in the herbs. And I'm gonna add that now to the filling mixture, which is the mashed up feta, the eggs, parmesan. And let the spinach cool a little bit so it doesn't cook the eggs immediately. And we'll season that with some black pepper and some grated nutmeg. You don't need to add salt to this because the feta is pretty salty and obviously the parmesan as well. So mix that up nicely. And I've greased my baking dish here. I've got my pastry between two dampened tea towels so it doesn't dry out too quickly. I'm going to put about half on the bottom in layers and the rest on top. So the important thing when you're working with phyllo pastry is to keep it moist as much as possible and don't hold back on your oil and butter. leaving plenty hanging over the edge because that's going to come 
onto the top and seal it all in. And then our last two on the bottom. Sheet number five. And six. I'm just going to cover up my pastry because we're about to deal with the filling. Pour our pastry in. Spread it out so it's all flat and even. And then, let me move this here so you can see nicely. Um, I fold over the pastry that's hanging over the edge. Keep brushing loads of oil and butter. Now we can start piling some more pastry on the top. Sometimes I actually cut it a bit to size. going to fold this next one in half slightly place it like that Slather the last of the oil and butter mix on the top so it's really, really covered. Now, importantly, before you bake it, you need to cut out your portions because it makes it much easier to serve. So I'm going to divide this into nine squares. This pie will comfortably feed eight. They're quite tall, these, these pieces. Don't cut all the way through to the bottom because otherwise your filling is going to leak through. So you just cut through the upper layer of pastry and not all the way to the edge either to avoid the filling leaking out. Once you've already cut half, it becomes a bit trickier to do the next ones. You do will see some filling poking through. It's really worth doing this. There we are. Now that is going to bake in the oven for about an hour. The temperature is 170 fan or 190 not fan. Here is our finished Spanakopita. And I must say, it looks and smells really appetising. So I'm going to dish it up and I'm going to eat it with a Greek salad that I've thrown together. That's just tomatoes, red onions, peppers, Kalamata olives, cucumber, some feta and some oregano dressed with olive oil and a little bit of lemon. and some black pepper. There we go. The recipe for this classic lemon tart comes from Frances Bissell, who used to write for The Times back in the late 90s. Her original version was for small individual tartlets. So I've adjusted the quantities and the cooking times over the years to make one big one. It uses a sweet short crust pastry and a basic short crust will always have the proportions two to one flour to butter. But in fact, this version has got slightly more butter proportionally, makes it a little bit richer. And it's also got an extra twist, which is the addition of some ground almonds 
and some chopped almonds as well that give it an extra nutty bite that I really like. So we're going to start by making the pastry and in my mixer, I always use a mixer to make pastry. Um, it's taken years of practice to finesse but it always works and it's quick and easy. In my mixer I've got 185 grams of flour and 20 grams of ground almonds and I'm going to add to that some chilled butter, 100 grams, and then with apologies for my patched up Maggi Mix lid, I'm um, going to whiz that until it's really looking like fine bread breadcrumbs. It's looking lovely and fine now. And then I'm going to add to that 20 grams of chopped almonds and a teaspoon of caster sugar. And if the pulse button worked on my machine, I would pulse it, but it doesn't. So I'm just going to whiz it very quickly like that. And finally, to bring it all together, I've got one egg yolk and in the freezer, some really chilled iced water. You don't want to use too much water. You don't want your pastry to be wet. So I just... There we are, it's all balled up together inside. So, sprinkle my work surface with a little bit of flour, plonk out the pastry, bring it together without handling it too much, just knead it very slightly to bring it into a smooth ball, soft as a baby's bottom, as my domestic science teacher, Mrs. Skelton used to say. And then wrap it in cling film. And chill it in the fridge for 30 minutes. My pastry's had 30 minutes in the fridge and I'm gonna roll it out now before chilling it again for another 30 minutes. So I've got a floured board here, floured rolling pin. Wrap it around the rolling pin. Lift it over and onto the tin. As I say, there will be a few cracks, but you can patch them up. So I'm pressing it in. And I will keep these little bits of off cuts wrapped in cling film in the fridge, again, to patch up any holes after the blind baking, because that can hide a multitude of sins once it's covered up by a filling. Those bits will be wrapped up together. That could even make a little individual tart if you had it in. Again, some people prefer not to prick their pastry until it's about to go in the oven, but I do mine before the next chill, just because it's a bit easier. Why do you prick it? It stops it rising up. The baking beans will help do that as well, but this keeps it flat against the base. So that's going to chill again for another 30 minutes. Here are the ingredients for the filling. We've got three lemons, which I'm going to zest and juice. Five eggs, three of which will be used whole, and then two, just the egg yolks. 175 grams of butter, and then the same quantity of caster sugar. The filling is basically a lemon curd mixture, and we've got a bain-marie, which is a bowl over some gently simmering water. And in that, I've got the zest of three lemons, the juice of three lemons, and I'm gonna add my eggs, which is three whole eggs, two egg yolks and 
my 175 grams of sugar and that's all got to stir together until the sugar dissolves at which point we'll start beating in the butter So you can see that's that's starting to thicken up now and I'm going to carry on stirring it over the heat for another few minutes and then move it and just leave it on the side to do its last th thickening. While the filling is uh, thickening up again we're going to blind bake the pastry. So had another 30 minutes chilling time and a tip I learned from a Bake Off contestant actually is scrunch up your baking paper and then unwrap it and put it on your chilled pastry like that and then I'm going to fill that with baking beans to weigh it down. I'm going to blind bake that for 50 minutes on a not particularly high heat actually, 150 degrees fan, uh, maybe 170, 180 normal, and then take out the baking beans and the paper, paint the bottom with some reserved egg white, that's egg white kept over from the yolk that we put in the pastry, and then stick it back in the oven for another five minutes after that. The shells had 15 minutes blind baking in the oven, and you can see that it's actually looking lovely and flat still, no shrinking. And I'm going to pour off the baking beans. And I could just put this back in the oven now to blind bake for a further five minutes. But another tip I've picked up from a Bake Off contestant, no prizes for getting what I, guessing what I do in my spare time, is to brush the surface of the pastry with a bit of egg white and that just seals it in and creates an impermeable surface so that the filling doesn't make the pastry go soggy. And you can see also that I've been baking it on a tray which actually I put in the oven to preheat with the oven so it's getting some heat flat from the bottom as well. There we go and that's now going to have another five minutes before we fill it. Now to fill the tart, I've got my lovely thick filling here now and pour it on, should come right up to the top. When it bakes it'll rise slightly but then it'll sink back down again as it cools afterwards. And that's going to cook on a very slightly higher heat, about 160 fan for about 25 minutes. You don't want it to burn. Before serving this, I've given it some time to chill because I want it to hold its shape when I cut into it. And you can dust it beforehand with icing sugar. Don't do that too far in advance because it could just dissolve into the surface. I'm gonna do that now. Just about a teaspoon of icing sugar I've got in this tea strainer. There we are. And I'm going to cut a slice. Very crispy pastry have come off there. So there we are, there is our lemon tart. We are now going to um, go on to the gallery view and I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions. Um, you could either type them in the chat um, or unmute yourself and ask Rachel a question. 
I, I do have one question actually, Rachel, if I can ask. Um, what happened to MasterChef? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I got through the, um, the application and the audition rounds and was due to take part in the live filming. Um, but then it kind of became clear that um, if I progressed in the competition, I would be taken out of school in a really crucial UCAS term. I was already at that time working on UCAS applications. And although I thought, oh, well, you know, I won't get very far, I won't do very well, I kind of decided that you can't enter a competition hoping you won't do very well in it. <laughs> so I withdrew actually before the live filming started. Yeah. So I can always imagine what might have been. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the floor? Yeah, Julie Morley, would you like to um, unmute yourself and ask? Oh, I see Julia says, which is my favorite of the dishes? Um, I think probably the one that I make the most is the spanakopita because I love in the summer having a really big kind of Greek style feast. Um, so that probably gets cooked most. Um, I think the most spectacular uh, looking one is the kulibiak and it always really impresses if you wheel it out for a dinner, dinner party. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lovely. I have actually a question that's come through to me on private chat. I'll quickly ask it, um, which was, what have you been cooking over uh, the lockdown in the summer? Um, I have been recording quite a lot of that on in Instagram, actually. Most recently in the summer, um, I've been doing a lot of stuff with the kind of lovely seasonal vegetables and fruits. So loads of stuff with courgettes. Um, plums at the moment, cherries, made a cherry cake at the weekend, mm. um, made a rhubarb parfait last week, um, and uh, lots of, at the moment, apples and blackberries. So blackberry and apple crumble and uh, blackberry and apple crumble ice cream. And I saw that uh, Mrs. Sandu's asked if my kids have inherited <laughs> my cooking skills. They are all really competent and enthusiastic cooks. Yes, I think they impress their friends at university that they can cook. They can rustle up a hollandaise um, and they are really genuinely interested as well. So I, I think they probably haven't had much choice. Uh, does my husband cook? He will, uh, he's on this call, so I have to be very careful. <laughs> he claimed that I, I've driven him from the kitchen. Um, <laughs> he does. He's, he's got a few really good things um, up his sleeve. Yeah. That sounds very similar to our household. <laughs> <laughs> from Christine, do you want to unmute yourself, Christine, and ask the question? Oh, that was just a... Uh, that was oh, a I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was just a thank you. Oh, I'll try to how to work out. So that was really fascinating. It, it's very late. How do you find the time? How do I find the time? Um, well, I mean, I have always when it's really really busy um at school then i might not cook every night but i do try to draw up a weekly menu and and we always aim to have something home cooked every night and i also um earmark saturdays are my days for writing about food and um recording my um updating my blog and everything like that so i carve out sort of ring fence time on saturdays i've um, years of practice <laughs> yeah, years of practice is, um, it was what I always said, it's probably really, really annoying for my children. I always said it, if they said to me when they were small, how do you know how to make curtains? Or how do you know how to do a French plat? Or, you know, how do you know how to do this? And I would always say years of practice, um, which was infuriating, no doubt, for them. Um, I was... Um... I've actually been very lucky to have read the blog in advance, of course, and I noticed on your blog that you have a lot um, of Hungarian or a whole Hungarian section. Can I ask why, why Hungarian, Rachel? Um, well, yes, my father, who's actually here, I can see him. Um, my father is Hungarian and um, 
so that is that informs a big part of our culinary experience our christmas meals are something else i have to say and um i i, I would say i I've, I've definitely learned to cook from my scottish mother who is an absolutely incredible cook and cooks a lot of hungarian food too and but also from both my grandmothers um from my hungarian grandmother and from my English grandmother, who is still alive at the age of 100. Wow. Good food. Mm. <laughs> That's the secret. Mm. <laughs> and we have another question. Uh, we have a question from, uh, from Mr. Um, Santu. Yeah, well, the key to feeding a largest family with variety. <laughs> um, well, um, and, and affordably as well. I have to say that was a big thing for me. Um, uh, at a, when my children were really young, I would plan the weekly min menu um, in advance and um, try to make sure that there was variety in that and then write a shopping list that was only the things that were on the weekly menu so that sort of meant that you didn't succumb to any impulse buys in the supermarket um, and I kept my weekly menus going back about 15 years until we moved house two years ago and tragically decided that they they couldn't come with us. So um, yeah, I had, I had a, a huge file of the weekly menus. I've started, them, I've started saving two, the, most la the last two years worth. Um, so, I mean, drawing up that weekly menu and then looking over it and, and thinking, um, you know, is there variety in that? The, the, the full planning, I think really right. works. So would you go um, back to previous weekly menus for a, a week or would, he, would you come up with a new one every single week? I would come up with a different menu every week, but it, the, the same dishes would get recycled time and time again. Um, and, you know, that sort of that classic, if you have a roast chicken on a Sunday, I would always make a stock and, and always kind of make a risotto or some soups or something um, in the week after. Um, and that, that, was, that was part of the rhythm. Yeah. Great. Great. Uh, there's another, yeah, there's another question asking, uh, do you bake bread? I have baked bread, yes. Um, I'd love, I, I think that's something that really is a labour of love and I'd love to have the time. Um, I've come across some really fascinating bread, bread recipes. I didn't, I didn't find myself making my own sourdough starter. It became a bit of a lockdown cliche, didn't it? But uh, yeah, I, it is an ambition to do a bit more bread, bread baking. I, li I like, um, I will quite often make something like soda bread or I made focaccia um, last autumn. Um, so I quite like the flavoured breads. Mm. Do we have any more questions? I know we're just, we're just running slightly over time, um, but we did start slightly over time. So. I know my husband promised me that he was going to ask a question, but uh, maybe he's feeling shy. <laughs> <laughs> Don, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Ah, apart from Dead Souls, any other literary inspirations? Um, funnily enough, um, we're, we're, my husband is currently reading um, the third Hilary Mantel, um, the third one of the trilogy, and um, in preparation for that reread Wolf Hall and um, bring up the bodies and and reminded me how much cooking there is how much reference there is to food in in those two books um, so um, I, I'm in terms of other literary literary stuff um, I can't think off the top of my head that's a really interesting question um, but it tends to be I mean I'm afraid my inspiration nowadays tends to come from the Guardian Saturday magazine and I try to cook something from that every week. I, I, this is Dom here, I will now ask a question. Why do we never have Lecho, Rach? <laughs> Lecho um, is a Hungarian um, pepper and tomato stew. It's a bit like um, piperade or um, ratatouille and I will I will make you lecho when I have a good stock of Hungarian peppers, okay? <laughs> we have got a book recommendation. Thank you, Toast by Nigel Slater. Oh yeah, I, uh, I 
I love Nigel Slater. I cook a lot of his recipes and I really, really like his writing. I love his two books, uh, Tender, the two volumes one and two that record what he did with growing vegetables and fruit um, in, his, in his garden. And um, other favorite cookery writers, I really like Nigella Lawson's writing. Um, I, I have to say, I know it's a, again a bit of a cliche, but I'm a great fan of Ottolenghi, despite the, the sort of rather recondite ingredients that he often um, requires you to purchase. Um, and uh, I'm just trying to think other ones that I often come... Funny enough, even though I find her incredibly patronising and I don't particularly like her style, there are some really good old Delia recipes that work a treat. Um, and she, she may not be the most scintillating person to read, but her recipes always turn out really well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you so much, um, Rachel. Your eclectic mix of subjects has been fascinating uh, for the entire evening. Um, I can't wait to try some of these recipes out myself. Um, and if, like me, you're feeling inspired and already filling your online shopping basket with ingredients, um, then please copy the link in the chat facility uh, to Rachel's blog. Um, I think we're just popping all, yeah, all the links in there. They'll be there shortly. I know Natasha's on that. Um, so please copy the, the link to the years of practice. Um, there'll be plenty of recipes there, um, plenty more recipes there to inspire you. And um, now, although our summer events programme is coming to a close, I am delighted to announce that on Tuesday, the 8th of September, the head, David Goodhue, has very kindly agreed to launch our new autumn virtual events programme with an evening talk giving a history of Latimer in 10 people. So please see our forthcoming events page on the website or follow the link in the chat to register for this and any of the other awesome term events. Um, you will also, um, you can also catch up on recordings now of all of our events from this series. We've got a brand new events video library. Um, if you are free to join us tomorrow, of course, for our final event in the summer series, Johnny White will be delivering a lunchtime lecture between one and two where he asks, are liberals really only Christians in denial? Links to register for that are also in the chat. Um, that brings us to the end of this evening. As always, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Rachel, for this evening's delicious masterclass. And I hope to see you all again very soon. Good night.